Well, welcome to our Explaining Red Flags with Holistic Review webinar. This is our episode number 11. My name is Pedro Mizani. I'm a family physician and uh, a former uh, resident selection committee uh, for two residency programs in, in family medicine and the founding president of uh, AC Medical. Today's webinar, uh, before we start talking about red flags, we wanted to talk a little bit more about holistic review. And the reason why I think that this is so important is because holistic review is penetrating into every aspect of resident selection, including medical school uh, candidate selection. So all the way from medical school, undergraduate medical education to graduate medical education, this holistic review has become the hot topic. It's an industry-wide movement. We've never seen anything like this before. And uh, the same people that were responsible for USMLE becoming pass-fail are responsible for uh, the implementation of holistic review. Now, what is holistic review? And I think this is really important for you to know because knowing holistic review is going to hopefully help you with addressing red flags. So the idea is not just to get a lot of interviews, but the quality of the interviews are as important, if not more important. So the program setting, you know, patient demographic, the mission and the goals of the program must match what the candidate is looking for. And that's the idea with a holistic review. So if the program can match those and, and invite candidates who can most likely make the program better in the setting that they're already located, then the candidates will most likely thrive and will most likely want to stay there to continue to serve the communities that they serve as residents. For 2024 match, programs are strongly discouraged from rejecting candidates based on, you know, traditional standardized screening factors such as USMLE scores or year of graduation. And programs are warned to guard against any intentional fallback to these traditional standards. And, and a lot of these are artificial barriers that uh, we've uh, been faced with over the years. Now, these artificial barriers cause the stalling of programs to become more diverse, to become more inclusive, you know, to be equitable, and to, for the residents to feel like they belong uh, to that residency or to that fellowship program. So in order to get there, the programs are encouraged to offer interviews after they holistically review each candidate's application. So rather than just using a standardized factor is to review the entire application, but key metrics within it. They need to identify skills, strengths, experiences, attributes of the candidate that will most likely help that candidate thrive in their program. And they want to see if that candidate is able to carry out the mission and the goals of the program. You'll notice that the mission and the goals of most of the same specialty programs are almost identical with the exception of their setting and, and some unique goals that they'd like to accomplish. But almost all of them, their goals are to carry out the ACGME core competencies and to produce positions that are competent in that specialty. So it's really not that challenging to, to reach those goals. And so the programs are supposed to identify how familiar the candidate is with those goals and have they ever done anything like that before? Do they understand the mission? Do they think the same as the program leadership? And also have they been in the setting that the program is located? Have they been in rural areas? Do they, have they lived there? Have they ever served the patient population that the program serves? And also another aspect of holistic review is to also identify underrepresented minorities in medicine and, and the abbreviation for that is URM and URM are those that self identify as uh, either Hispanic or Latino, black or African American, American Indian or Alaskan native or native of Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. And the reason for that is about a third of United States population are uh, underrepresented um, uh, minorities self-identified, whereas only 11% of the country's physicians are URM, underrepresented minorities. And so uh, a part of the task force, why Holistic Review has been uh, implemented is to identify underrepresented minorities, to be able to get them into the system and into being a, our physician workforce. Now, what about the 66% who do not self-identify as underrepresented? Well, the emphasis would have to be a lot heavier on non-racial and ethnic factors. For example, experience in various settings, living in different U.S. cities, uh, commitment to specialty, maybe possibly even having several personal statements that is divided up into different regions or maybe different settings. And I would recommend that the entire ERS application is prepared with the interview in mind. 
So this year, it's not a bad idea to do your interview preparation before you put your ERS application together so that you have an idea of how these programs are going to take, what they've been practicing in applicant selection, and then how are they going to implement it in the uh, actual interviews and in the rank order list. So red flags. Best practices when it comes to red flags is to just prevent them if you can. And so you all being here is, uh, is a great sign that, uh, that you're interested in knowing what those are or how to address them. And, and for those of you that are really early in your medical career, medical students, second, third years, you have a really great opportunity to be able to prevent a lot of these. A lot of times red flags are actually non-existent, but they become existent as a result of the candidate believing that this is a big deal. And one example of that is, for example, a year of graduation. Those that really think of their year of graduation as a crutch, unfortunately, it, it presents itself that way in the interview and, and it really then becomes a red flag. Next, you want to make sure that you identify all of the red flags and you want to be uh, honest with yourself and you want to discuss them with, a, with an expert mentor and you want to be accountable for what has happened. And, you know, how does this red flag impact your leadership, professionalism, communication? Were there red flags that were out of your control? cause you hardship that you had to overcome. And as a result, as a result of all of this, how did these red flags and you overcoming them make you a better fit for the program? Now, on the bottom of every single one of the slides, you'll notice that yellow highlight text. And that's generally the essence of holistic review, diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging, mission, goals, skills, experiences, attributes, and and uh, underrepresented minorities within the physician community. So every red flag uh, category and red flags that you see, I want you to keep looking at the highlights of holistic review and, and see how do we explain this and, and how do we hold ourselves accountable and what do we learn from this and how does all of this make us a better leader? You know, leaders are not born, you know, they're, they're trained uh, and, and really great leaders are those that have had a lot of experience and they bang their head against the wall several times, but they survived it. And they surround themselves with people that know a lot and, and experts and, and because of the people that they have around them, because of their own will, because of their own, you know, communication and, and, uh, and drive, uh, they survive it. And then, and those are the people that we want as leaders. So. Red flags are not all bad. Um, and so that's how I want you to really think about it. So think of these challenges that you've had in, 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 in the context of holistic review. So first category of red flags are gaps during medical education. Some samples are, for example, leave of absence from a US medical school. I'm gonna make a little bit of comment about each one of these and, and potentially how uh, it could be interpreted. Now, you know, uh, explaining red flags is a, is a highly personalized phenomenon because uh, some have a really good story to tell about their red flags and, and some just uh, are unable to defend it. So leave of absence from a U.S. medical school, uh, we usually see that in an MSPE. And, uh, you know, these leave of absences are not, you know, one year off because of research or, or other uh, issues. But in U.S. medical schools, it's quite unlikely to see students that take, you know, big, long leaves of absences. We see a lot more in, in international medical schools and, and they have their reasons why that, that has happened. But explaining gaps in US medical school, if it was because of leave of absence, because of research or doing a, an, a secondary program, then explain it. One of the, one of the uh, examples I had the other day was an individual wanted to apply to dermatology. And so she took a one year gap, a gap year to do some dermatology research, but she did it in the middle of her uh, medical education right after her course in the beginning of her electives, but the medical school approved this. So that type of leave of absence, which was approved is acceptable. And as long as it's mentioned that way in MSB, then she's fine. But if it is not, then there's inconsistency in why you did it and how, what MSB says, then that's a problem. Leave of absences uh, from an international medical school, transferring medical schools, that's a very common thing that we see. Um, again, this is typically seen with international medical students. A lot of medical students from abroad, they, they, they're just so, they were petrified of taking the USMLE. So they would, they would take these extended uh, leaves to study for the USMLEs, which again, and that was common in, in the United States, well, not as common in the United States, but, but we would see some, but the, it, was, it was quite stressful. And, uh, you know, mentally it was very, very damaging to a lot of these candidates. And, 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 you know, from a time perspective, some would take three, four, five years off to study for these USMLEs because they knew how important their score was. So 
extend the time to study under medical schools would allow them to do it or attending U.S. observerships. If something like this happened, I think it's really important that you acknowledge in your personal statement or maybe acknowledging how needing the need to compete with a high score in USMLE was paralyzing. And talk about that and how it impacted you and what did you do as a result, uh, if that applies to you. Uh, you may not want to talk about it in that much detail, but if you are going to talk about it, I think being accountable for it and 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 knowing that it is a, a, a problem that, that the programs are going to want some sort of an explanation for, because not only did you take longer than expected to study for these USMLEs, but you also, it extended your graduation. Attending US observerships and, and, and that extending your graduation, that could be approved or not approved. Uh, and if it is approved, that's wonderful. It is If it is not approved, you still want to make sure that it is mentioned in your MSP if it impacted your uh, your graduation. But you know, explaining that is is pretty straightforward. If there were failed courses or rotations, you have no choice but to discuss it. Uh, there are special ways of um, of discussing it in the MSP, which is not as damaging. Uh, so focusing more on on the passing and 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 how did you improve during this process is a lot better than than focusing on the failure and. Another red flag that we see is if the medical student or the graduate says that, uh, hey, yeah, I see that, but they say no to the question, has your medical education or training been interrupted? And, and they say no to that. And that's that's really bad, friendly advice. And uh, anybody that tells you to, to say no to that is uh, is, is probably, um, you know, that's not something that I would, uh, I would trust their, their, their word on. So training and education, if it is, um, you know, if it is, uh, you know, more than typical. Uh, so let's say that uh, you know, if it's just one or two months because you were waiting on your degree, maybe that's not a, a an extension. But if it is something that is going to be mentioned in MSB, then you certainly need to corroborate in your ERAS application uh, as well. Red flags in your MSPE. Uh, you know, if the dean is making recommendations in that MSP, or if it looks like the old dean's letter style, then those are red flags. The way to deal with those is just to identify them and then, you know, to make sure that the, the, the medical school generates a, a new MSP based on the AAMC recommended guidelines for how MSP should be drafted. So the other red flag in an MSP, if it's just about you and it doesn't say anything else about uh, the rest of your classmates in, in your cohort, the way to fix that is to make sure that you speak with your dean, you speak with your school, and uh, and make sure that they are doing comparative analysis between you and and uh, your other classmates. It doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be extremely deep. It could, uh, as long as there's comparisons and we know what quartile you fall fall in, and 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 the content is similar to what we see in U.S. medical school uh, MSPEs. If you're from an international uh, medical school, then then it's it's acceptable. It just has to look. Uh, familiar to the eyes of U.S. medical uh, graduates who who know MSB in, in the way that their medical school drafted it, which is almost all of them are in compliance with AAMC recommended guidelines. None of them are written in Dean's letter style. If there is inconsistency between your ERAS and your MSPE, especially if it's a negative, you know, if it's something that, that uh, you, for example, you failed a class uh, or you had to repeat a year uh, and you don't talk about it in your ERAS application. So that's why you should get a copy of your MSP to see what it is that they're saying. And sometimes we just, we forget what, what happened. And to us at that point, maybe it was not that important, uh, but to programs it is. So get a copy of your MSP and make sure you, you sit together with your uh, with your mentor and, and go through it or your dean and, and uh, compare side by side with your ERAS application. Um, if there's mention of unprofessional behavior in your MSPE, that's uh, that's problematic. So again, the the you know best practice is is to never find yourself in a situation like that. But unprofessional behavior is something that uh, if it's if it's in MSPE, it really does bother residency programs, and um, and they do hold that against uh, the candidates a lot if they pick up on it. But if you do see that, you want to a avoid it. Make sure you never find yourself in a situation like that, and and discuss it with your dean and and see if there's any way that it could be remedied and if not then you know it's it's on a case by case basis speak with your mentor to see how you can um, bolster up the rest of your application and and how can you explain this if there's unprofessional behavior in your MSPE i think indirectly is something that needs to be uh, explained in in a personal statement very very carefully but i wouldn't say 100% of the cases but most likely i would recommend that it be somehow be discussed Another red flag is that if, you know, it's it's 
not so much of a red flag. It's it's more of a you know it's just uh, it's it's displeasing to the the reader. Is if the medical school information page just has a URL, uh, especially a very long one, uh, and it's telling the reader to go to this URL, uh, or if it's a very short one and is directed to the homepage of the medical school, both of them are are um, you know not recommended at all. So again, these are just some of the most common MSV uh, red flags, and and uh, now that you know them, you know take some proactive action to to avoid them. Your graduation. I'm an old graduate. Uh, you know, if if uh, you've come to our previous uh, webinars, I I always discourage anyone who's graduated from medical school to ever call themselves an old graduate. And uh, you know, the only thing old about uh, an application is uh, is how how you've allowed your experience and your relevance to residency, uh, how you've allowed it to age, that really comes in the form of GAP post-graduation, which we'll cover next. But the concern that we have with year graduation, which could potentially be a red flag, is if all of the experiences that you've had are from abroad, if that notion of having graduated 10, 15 years ago, if we can even hear it in your voice and you don't have the confidence to, to carry out the duties of a PGY-1, or if teachability is a concern, if you've gotten to a point where you've made up your mind and you know how things are done and not really willing to listen to constructive feedback and criticism, and the only way we would know about that is if by looking at genuine letters of recommendation and see how you perform there, or if you're doing audition rotations with our program and, and we'll be able to tell there. So, and and also, the other concern that we have is if somebody is uh, you know, more veteran graduate, is their respect higher towards attendings versus other residents that are much younger than them? And so we, we will see a lot of those in, in rotations. We will see a lot of that in the, in the language that's used in, in ERAS, especially now that ERAS is, um, is uh, you know, it's all about the 10 experiences that you choose to talk about. So we can really tell a lot about how the applicant is thinking despite their year of graduation. So gap post-graduation. So these are some examples that uh, that our audience provided us. Uh, from 2019 to 2023, had a gap. I uh, was a full-time mom. 2018, international medical graduate, no US clinical experience until two months ago. So the first one, 2019 to 2023, is it a gap? Yes. Is it a red flag? Um, you know, it depends on how you explain it. If you we're a full-time mom and uh, that experience uh, is something that I would probably want to talk about in uh, my ERAS application and you can certainly discuss it in your personal statement but not from the you know not from the angle of a four-year gap potentially four and a half years but 2019 to 2023 I, I you know I had to uh, you know I had to be with my family I was a mom uh, but 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 then it became time for me to focus back on my professional uh, development and and now that I have family taking care of my children, now I can focus on myself. What this taught me is how to prioritize, but also to not apply to residency when I when there's a possibility that I uh, that I may need to pause because of, of my family. So once I dealt with those and I felt like I was, you know, I, I was in a good position to be able to finish residency uh, in its entirety, that's that's when I applied to program. So you could take that gap and, and turn it to a positive. And I think that there'll be a, a positive point in your application if you can explain it properly. And most moms can, and most dads can as well. In contrast to the next one, which is a 2018 international medical graduate with no US clinical experience until two months ago, I would have some interview questions for this individual. And I would want to know why is it that, you know, from 2018 to 2023, why was that gap there? And the reason why we're concerned about that is that your patient contact out uh, near the start of residency it is, is is directly correlated with patient morbidity and mortality. You know, that's why we want to know about your clinical experience. And that's why a gap is not something that's, a gap is something that's frowned upon. And, and uh, you know, we don't want you to be away from medicine for too long. However, uh, if you were away for quite some time, and then the six months before residency application season starts, you, you, you know, you buckled up and you started doing clinical rotations and you uh, progressively improve the, uh, the the competitiveness of of your application by doing harder and harder and harder clinicals and and you receive letters of recommendation and you have maybe even one or two from program directors. Uh, that's a that's a good story. That that shows you know that that shows us someone who's who's teachable, who's um, you know who can uh, who can who can overcome that hardship and and you know maybe that that individual is is worth uh, 
had him spending a little bit more time on and, and interviewing. Just studying for USMLE steps and not doing rotations, you know, that's, uh, we, we do see some of our candidates this way. And, and if this is you, fix it now. You know, it's, it is July. You still have time, July, August, you know, September. You still have three months to, um, to make up for this gap. And so get right into clinicals, but make sure it's residency relevant, right? Make sure it's not just like a scribe or medical assisting position. Um, so if this is your, uh, this is your uh, red flag, then, then um, address it that way. And then patient contact must be continuous pre-residency start in July, which uh, we discussed. Now, failed attempts at board exams, you, we see this a lot. Uh, you know, for, for 20 years, I've, I've always said that scores did not matter to me. I, I, I didn't really care what, what uh, other mentors thought about my, my statement, but scores never mattered to me. To what mattered to, to me and my team and to all of our members and to those that I was successful in making sure that they also uh, echo the same is did you pass the exam on the first attempt? And and passing on the first attempt is, you know, it's a, it's a telltale sign of what could potentially happen with your performance with the specialty board exams and, and possibly step three. You know, and this, this applies to both the United States Medical License Exam or Comlex. We didn't really put the specialty board exams here because our audience here are, are mostly residency candidates rather than, you know, fellowship candidates. So USMLE or Comlex. We did have an audience that said, you know, look, I, I took a leave of absence and then I passed Comlex level one and level two on the second attempt. And I want to discuss that as, a, as an impactful experience in my personal statement. You can, I would, you know, I would want to know how are you going to explain that second attempt? And, and everybody does it a little bit differently. So maybe it was uh, because of the pandemic. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe it was a health uh, concern. Uh, so being able to explain what that second attempt, what the, the, the cause of it was, is, is important. But having a second attempt on both of the, the board exams is, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit more challenging to, to overcome. And I was pretty surprised the first time that, that I heard, uh, you know, I, I was speaking with, uh, with our clients and I said, how many attempts have you had on your USMLE? And they said, I've had no attempts. I said, but you passed it. And uh, they would say, well, yeah, I just, I, I passed it. I had no attempts. The first time you sit for, for any of these board exams, that is your first attempt. And then, uh, you know, your second sitting is your second attempt and third attempt and, you know, so on and so forth. And so if you say I've had zero attempts in an interview where you've, pass it on the second attempt, then that is a red flag also, because it would, you know, makes us question how familiar are you with, with just how things are done in graduate medical education in the United States. Now, a couple of variations of that. If you've had multiple attempts on the USMLEs in Comlex, but you've not passed step three or level three, depending on you know, how the quality of your clinical rotations, the rest of your application, I may or may not recommend that you sit for step three or level three. However, you may not have a choice. If you've had a failure in those um and and you know one of the previous usmle's uh, or, or complex because our concern is that if you fail the step then you could potentially fail step three in residency and our concern is are we giving an interview to someone who's not potentially licensable or is going to take them a you know very long time to to pass this step three and they're always going to be on the program directors under their license uh one of my co-residents he, he failed step three and and the program immediately put him on probation. He failed it again, and and then then for a third time, and then he, they kicked him out uh, as a PGY two. And so it's a really important factor to to consider if this is you, and and you really got to put a lot of thought into it in how you're going to strategize. Unfortunately, most people strategize by um, you know when they fail step one and step two, they then they just jump into step three, and then they fail step three. And that, at that point, I mean that's that's uh, really really hard to 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 come back from. Uh, so you're pretty much committed to passing that step three. And by the time you pass it, uh, Lord knows how many years that's going to take. So if, if you are in this situation, stop, right? Stop and, and figure out why this has happened. And and you you got to understand what step three or level three is about. It's the test of internship. And so if you haven't done any clinicals in the U.S. that resembles that and you haven't done it consistently, don't sit for that exam, right? you got to train your brain to be able to pass this exam. And so it's going to take a lot of steps. Uh, from a holistic review perspective, same thing as far as overcoming hardships and and barriers and uh, especially if you're let's say for you you've had a step one score and then your port point differential between step one and ck uh was like 40 points learning how to take these exams is it could be an uh, an, uh, an approach that you want to take and uh, and if you pass step three on the first attempt after all of this and that's a really good story switching specialties this is mostly 
international medical graduates that are surgeons, plastic surgeons in their country, maybe let's say they're OBGYNs and then they come to the United States and they switch to internal medicine or, or, or another specialty. Sometimes it's because it's just easier to, to get into one of the primary care. Well, it's never easy. None of these specialties are easy to get into, but it's a little bit less competitive because there's lower number of US medical graduates in, in the um, you know, non-surgical fields. That's sometimes the case. Uh, sometimes they're just tired of being on call all the time. Sometimes, you know, life priority has changed. Uh, sometimes they, they're full-time moms and they, they, they need to be there for their families and, and family medicine or internal medicine is a lot better choice. And so if you're able to explain that, then uh, that, is, that is perfectly uh, acceptable. But you've got to have a story and you've got to not just say that I was tired of lifestyle and that's why I want to be an internist. You know, it's not a, you know, no specialty wants to be a backup specialty. So let's say that you got, you came to that conclusion on your own. Well, now you have to test that hypothesis. And the way you test that hypothesis is you have to do experiences in the specialty that you now want to go into. So if you're switching from surgery, plastic surgery into internal medicine, you, you got to exhibit internal medicine experiences in the US that you've either honored, you've got letters of recommendation from, you can talk about, you're gonna use as experiences in your ERAS application, and you'll be able to uh, you know, use those experiences and the ACGME core competencies uh, skills that you've gained from it, how, you're gonna use those to help the program accomplish and, and reach its goals, right? And so that's how you use your clinical experiences in the US, whether you're switching or not, you use those clinical experiences to show the program, hey, you can holistically review me. This is this is this is how I recommend. This is my background, and these are my experiences, and that's why I can help the program, and that's why I would be an asset. Next one is general practice to transitional uh, or internal medicine preliminary. What a big mistake! Transitional and internal medicine preliminary are not uh, there to give a medical graduate who's having a tough time getting into residency just one year of residency. These are meant to be the first year residency for advanced specialties, and so if uh, and with, with, with maybe one or two exception programs that are out there, and maybe with, with the exception of general surgery preliminary. Uh, and, and I'll explain that just a little bit. But if you're going from general practice in another country and coming in and you've had a tough time getting into residency two, three years, and, and you have a transitional option or an internal medicine preliminary, if you don't plan for this appropriately and you think that just going into transitional and you're good to go, and, and you'll just perform and, and the program director or, or you'll find a PGY2, uh, it's much, much tougher than, than you think. If you plan for it appropriately and you're applying to categoricals to begin with, and this transitional is just an absolute, absolute, absolute backup, or an internal medicine prelim is an absolute backup, or you're not going to take your budget from, you know, from applying to three, 400 programs, take a hundred of that and apply to internal medicine preliminary or transitional. If you're not going to do that, then, then maybe I'll accept it. But otherwise, it's not a good idea unless you have an advanced specialty in mind. So a red flag would be someone who's just applying a transitional and they have no letters of recommendation from an advanced specialty. Uh, their personal statements say nothing about, for example, neurodevelopmental disabilities or dermatology or anesthesiology or uh, neurology uh, or interventional radiology, whatever the advanced specialty is. It says nothing about that. There's no direction towards that. Uh, so those are red flags. So again, best practice is to avoid it. Or if you're going to go down this route, uh, have some really strong mentorship so that you know exactly how to plan for this and strategize. Another red flag is lack of commitment to specialty. You know, we, it happens to us all the time. And family medicine is, is uh, all the specialties are beginning to be incredibly, uh, look for that commitment, but especially family medicine. If we see that someone is applying, is a member of the American College of Physicians and a member of the American Academy of Family Physicians, and they've applied to both of us, so we're going to assume at that point they applied to both I am and FF. Most likely, nine out of ten, nine out of ten, family medicine program is probably going to stop looking at that candidate. Uh, so that's a red flag. So how do you deal with that? Commit to a specialty and move forward with it. And that's a tough decision to make because most of the med school advisors tell you, "Well, pick a specialty and a backup specialty." Uh, residency programs hate that. So pick a specialty, commit to it. Your application is going to be significantly stronger. You're going to feel better. You're not going to have to live, you know, two, three different lives of, of a specialist that lives you know, as an anesthesiologist and then as a surgeon, as a, you know, as an OBGYN. I mean, that's tough. How are you going to put all those letters together? How are you going to put an application together that shows commitment to all three? It's not. And we see those results in, in, in the drop in the number of match and the drop in the total number of interviews to, for people that have two, three, four specialties on the rank order list. So red flag is if we don't see the specialty that is our program, just 
studded all over your application. I want to see the word family medicine everywhere. I want to see the word internal medicine everywhere. I want to see the word surgery everywhere. I want to see OBGYN everywhere. So once you commit, go 100%, go all in. The other problem that we have, okay, let's say so as far as switching specialties, if there's not a commitment to specialty, the reason why this is a problem is that we don't want to lose residents. We, we don't want you to come in and, uh, and then decide, you know, after two, three months of, I don't know, pathology, that this is really not for you. Or after two, three months of surgery that, um, you know, is 80 to 120 hour weeks is really not for you. So that's why it's, you know, the switching of specialties, we take it pretty seriously. And the only way that we're going to be able to, you're going to, you're going to gain a little bit of our, 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 our attention is, is if we see that you've done plenty of experiences in the new specialty and, and you've, you've lasted through it. Uh, so you got to have enough U.S. experience to support that transfer and, uh, and, and have a plausible reason to, to switch. Now, next, this is for our attendees who secured residency in the U.S. before or fellowship and uh, either did complete it or not complete it. So the next three slides are all the different variations of this. And if you fall into any of this, which is not that many of you, it's, it's, it's probably, thankfully, it's just a handful. If it would say, yes, I'm currently a, you know, if, if you're a resident or fellow in good standing, fine. Well, if you're a fellow in good standing, why are you back in ERAS again? That is a red flag. If you're a resident in good standing now seeking fellowship, okay, I understand that. That's fine. That's not a red flag. Unless you're in your PGY-1 and you're seeking fellowship. So that either tells me that there's something that's wrong in your PGY-1 or I don't know what you're doing. If you're a preliminary resident in good standing now seeking an advanced uh, R category or, ca or, or categorical position for board eligibility, makes sense. If you're a resident, however, your graduation may be in danger if you're um, on probation. We see that happen and, and it comes in the form of specialty switch. So we get a candidate who's currently a resident at a program with you know flying colors, um, everything is great. And then we see them applying to a whole different specialty. And so somewhere between you know the time that they certified their application and, and by the time they interview, uh, a lot of things could have happened. So we're, we're pretty cautious with, with, with uh, those candidates that are switching specialty and they're, they're in a current residency. Not that it's all bad at all, but it's just a, uh, it's, it's just a flag, right? We want to, we want to make sure that, that there's nothing else that's going on. Other categories. Yes. However, I did not get past the first 45 days of residency. Another one, I did not get past the first 45 days of fellowship. And those first 45 days are critical because, uh, you know, they tell us a lot. If, if, the program is obligated to keep you unless there was a serious issue. You're in drug screen, um, patient endangerment, falsification of, of records. Let's say that somebody was in a previous residency, they didn't say it, and then they found out, you know, in the first one or two weeks of residency. So those are those are issues. If they resigned or were terminated from residency prior to graduation, obviously at that point it would be considered a residency reentry. And then if they were terminated in fellowship, then you know, from fellowship before graduation, there'll be a fellowship reentry. You could also become a licensed physician after partially completing a residency. That's also a red flag because we would want to know why is it that you did not complete your, your full course of residency. We're kind of step jumping ahead a little bit, but we did have to do that because some of our audience uh, are, are residency reentry. So I wanted to make sure that we, we discuss this. So lots of different variations of being a resident or having a match into residency and then applying to residency again. So just be very mindful now. An example of where it's truly not a red flag and you make it a red flag. Let's say you did residency abroad. And then in your ERAS, you say that you in the section of training, you mentioned the name of your residency under training in your ERAS, where it clearly says that this training is for ACGME accredited programs only. So let's say that you did residency in India or UK or wherever. And you put that on the training because you're so proud of it as residents, as, as, a, as a residency training, and you believe that that residency training makes you a more competitive PGY-1. It does not. If you've had training, I mean, think about it. If, if I go into PGY-1 right now, I'm going to have a tough time, right? Because, you know, I've, I've been there and, you know, as, as much as I want to be, you know, teachable and learn, it's going to be tough, right? Because uh, my, my skin is hardened, you know, and so I've been battle hardened. And the same thing with residency. So, that's why it's good to, you know, you use that to your advantage. Don't go ahead and, and you know, showcase it everywhere, especially if you put it in the wrong section of the ERAS. Now, if we see training and you, you, you clearly put this ACGME and we see a country that's outside of the United States, number one, you don't read direction well, 
That's a red flag. And two, now you're telling me that you're potentially residency reentry. And so that's an example of creating a red flag where there would not have been otherwise. All right. Can a program tell that I've been through the match before? A red flag would be, you know, if we can tell from your letters of recommendation that you've reused from previous match cycles, you know, if, if they were from, you know, if they were timestamped from, uh, from previous years. So, you know, just, just start everything, you know, fresh, but let's say you're in an interview and you know, they ask you about your past match experiences and you decide to volunteer that, yeah, you've, you've been through the match. This is your sixth attempt. That's a red flag. It's a big red flag because, you know, that just should not happen. You got to accelerate that process of residency entry. And, uh, and if it's not been done, then, then there are, you know, we, we want to wonder, we want to, we wonder why for our U S medical graduates who don't match the first time around U S medical graduates have a lower percentage of match rate than international medical graduates. Now, the first time I saw that it was, I was shocked. U S medical seniors are right around 93, 94%. Osteopathic seniors are 92%. International medical graduates are somewhere between 58 and 62 percent. U.S. medical graduates are at between 40 and 44 percent. And the reason for that is if a U.S. medical graduate with a 94 percent chance of matching did not match, there's probably something. Probably. I mean, sure, luck, maybe. And U.S. medical seniors have to secure a lot more interviews than international medical graduates. But it is a little bit more concerning when a U.S. medical senior does not match, uh, because again, they're walking into it with a 94% chance of matching. So we would wanna um, we wanna explore that just a little bit more. Red flag, just personal red flag. It happens every year. Let's say that you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking with you, and and I said, well, how many interviews have you secured? And he said, well, I have six interviews. And to me, if I'm looking at the application, it just doesn't make sense. How did these six interviews come? And sometimes my next question is, well. Were these interviews offered to you as a result of you knowing somebody in the program? And for those of you that, that do securities courtesy interviews, it's okay as long as you are being interviewed with the rest of the interviewees in the same exact uh, fashion and format. So a 15 minute meeting with a program director is not an interview. A day long interview with multiple faculties of the program with residents the same way as all the other candidates go i'm okay with that type of courtesy interview i would just want to make sure that we number one we figure out why did that have to be courtesy and rather than the natural way, way which is acceptable because there's thousands of applicants so if we can kind of nudge and get their attention that's fine but we want to make sure that there's nothing that you're going to walk into that you just don't match to the program um Let's say that you look at the the, the resident, um, the makeup of the residents, and there's not a single resident or faculty uh, that is not Caucasian, and you are absolutely excited about going to this this program. Well, you know, I think that I would have a conversation with you, and and if, especially if you've never been to the United States, do you know what this means, and can you really adapt to the U.S. culture and not become a you know get on the radar? Because all it takes is just you mispronouncing a couple of uh, you know common terminologies, and there are bullies in residency. You know there are bullies in residency, and and they could make your life a living hell. So it's really important that whether you accept those courtesy interviews or not, because to because a lot of people just hang their whole life and head on 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 these courtesy interviews, and they let years and years go by because of them. So again, that's a personal red flag that we got to figure out why is it that you're you're needing to rely on that. Uh, and of course, if there's no interviews, that's certainly a red flag. That could be for so many different reasons. Uh, one of the most, two of the most common reasons why interviews don't come. Number one is if somebody has red flags and then they they buy a list of the programs that they think that they qualify for. You know, I don't know of a single program in the country that is okay with multiple board attempts. I don't, I don't, I don't know of anyone that is. They all have a concern when that happens. And so, you know, if you buy a list that says that they don't have a a, a, a number of attempts as a requirement and then you pour all of your money into those type of programs and you still don't get interviews well what that tells me is that you're not addressing the multiple attempts head on and and doing something about it which is potentially you need to prepare for step three and you need to do a lot of clinicals and you need to be accountable and you got to figure out how to address this failure so anyways next being flagged by nrmp eras ccfmg us mle etc happens all the time you know this happens all of the time some of the most common I'll give you two examples. One of the most common and the easiest way to get flagged is if you contact, if you're SOAP eligible, you do not withdraw from the match and you contact 
a program either by phone before they contact you, or you contact the program that does not participate in SOAP and you're SOAP eligible. That's one of the best ways. So a lot of these programs, it's kind of vindictive. They'll take your information and they'll just report and they'll send all the emails to, to NRMP and NRMP will, will start um, an investigation and, and that's how somebody could get flagged. Another way of getting flagged is by putting in uh, experiences that didn't happen. And uh, those get pretty ugly. They'll do full investigations on, on, on those experiences. So know that this happens and they will go after experiences that just kind of doesn't make sense. Don't oversell yourself. Really think about this entire application as your opportunity to, to be a better physician. I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am with the, all these changes and, and holistic review. Most people think, you know, this is the end of the world. I love it because as I, the more I think about it, there's nothing more that I wanted than residents that, that we all fit in and we were all doing the same thing. And, and it just felt good. You just belong to that program. And the reason why I know that is because I transferred. I went from a program that I did not belong and three of my colleagues got kicked out. And I was going to be the fourth one. And I transferred into one that I became the chief resident. So, you know, it's really important that you end up at a program that, that you belong and, and they help you thrive. And if you make a mistake here and there, they'll allow you to correct it if you are accountable for what's happened. So um, again, this is, this is all good. This is all good. The other problem, it's not a red flag. If you're applying to SOAP only, it's only a red flag if you're not able to explain it if you're in an interview. Why did you, you know, why were you not prepared uh, on September 26th and, you know, had all this time? And, and so that, that's a little bit of a telltale sign uh, with regards to a PGY1 performance. There are some publications that correlate the day that you certify your ERAS application, the later it is, the more problems that PGY1 could have as a resident. I was pretty shocked to see that, but there are programs that try to make that connection. Long and the short of it, apply on September 26th, it's not gonna be an issue. If a program asks you why you're participating in SOAP, it could be so many different reasons. You could be off cycle, you could have had a leave of absence, it could have been a family problem that you had to deal with, COVID, so many different things, but just be prepared for those questions. If your quality of your interview, your communication does not match the ERAS application you submitted. For all of you that are, you know, that use outside services to, to put your ERAS application together or pieces of it, really pick that organization wisely. The way that we do it at AC Medical is every service that we offer outside of clinic, including clinicals, you are involved, every bit of it, every step of it including the drafting services. And so it's all your words. And we always encourage that. Uh, as far as wordsmithing and making sure that you can deliver that better, that's what we do, right? That's how you, you know, sometimes that's all you need to become uh, you know, uh, more competitive. And that's all the advantage that you need. Another problem that we foresee now, which could be a red flag, is with the new ERAS application, there is a high chance that you're going to have gaps in your ERAS that you have not explained because you only get 10 experiences that you can mention. Whereas in the previous ERAS, you have to just, you know, go through a chronological order of all your experiences, back to back the dates, make sure the dates match. I don't think that's the idea anymore, right? Because you're just supposed to pick 10 experiences and talk about it. So one experience could be from 10 years ago, another one could be today. So that is a potential red flag that you gotta be prepared for. So as you're putting your experiences together, my recommendation is to try to keep it as back to back as possible when you're looking at these days, just in case, just in case you're asked the question, what did you purposefully omit from your application during an interview? Or if there's a problem in residency, you don't want the program director to say you misrepresented, you certified this application, you said this contains everything that, it, that uh, in your past and, and it doesn't, and you, you omitted this fact. So you have to figure out exactly what all these red flags are that could potentially become problems. And somewhere in your application, you gotta just, you gotta stick it in there and you gotta talk about it. So you're, you're protecting yourself. Yeah, uh, communication skills sharply different than ERAS quality um, and, and purposeful omission of facts or, or, or um, you know, un, unbeknownst to, to you. We, this happened, this, this happened a couple of months ago where uh, without going into too much detail, a residency entry, re-entry, just even to, to, to me didn't, disclose all of the facts. I mean, I really had to dig a lot to figure all these things out and did the same thing to the, to the, to the second program that they, three, three residencies that, that he was with and didn't disclose the, the, the two at all to the, to the third program. And, uh, that really, really pissed off the program, but the program didn't do anything about it and they let it, him continue. And it was just, it was a mess. 
But training, we kind of discussed, don't talk about international residency under training. Don't put that in your ERAS application. ERAS and match. Okay. Yeah. So there is uh, let me see. I think I can talk about. Okay. So next red flags, insufficient familiarity with us healthcare. I mean, this is a gut feeling that like when we look at an application, does this individual, can they, can they carry their own weight as a day one without somebody being there holding their hand? And we can really tell that by, you know, we'll just jump right into letters of recommendation, see who wrote it, you know, whether in any of these experiences, it's a little bit different now, but any of the experiences, is it all about research? Is it all about foreign work? Is it all about, you know, uh, associations that you were part of, uh, and, and barely anything about us, uh, clinical experiences that resembles what a us medical senior would do. Uh, those are telltale signs. And, you know, you combine that with old letters of recommendation or foreign letters of recommendation. That tells us a lot. If, if all of your rotations were telerotations, it's, I'm not, a, I, that doesn't bother me so much unless you had the opportunity to, to do them in person, but you didn't. Now, why is that bothersome? If you were able to do in person, but you did not, you chose to do telerotation, you either had too much going on or it could have been a cost thing. It could have been that you couldn't travel because of COVID. You could have been doing an in-person rotation and a tele-rotation both together. All of them are questionable some way or shape. But if you could do in-person and you didn't, my concern would be, do those same responsibilities and, and obligations, do they carry over to residency? And have you dealt with them already? It could be, you know, you have a child, you're married, you just got married, you have a business. I can't believe some of the, the candidates, they're just so proud of the businesses that they own. And they want to talk about it all over their ERAS application about how many people they're helping because of their businesses. Well, did you know in your contract with, with residency programs, they expressly forbid you from doing anything outside of residency? If you know that, why would you create a red flag for yourself, right? So those are what we're worried about. Now, uninsured, or if you're in a free clinic and just because it's a free clinic, you do a lot and you're uninsured, especially if you're a graduate, um, not everyone looks at it this deeply. I do. A lot of my colleagues that I know do. A lot of state medical boards do. A lot of district attorneys do. A lot of undercover patients do. And uh, so it's really important if you're a medical graduate in these uh, clinical settings, are you doing more than you should? And so be very careful in, in how you explain all of these experiences. Think of it this way. If you graduated, you got an MD, and let's say you walk into you know, a patient room and you introduce yourself, well, I'm a physician in training. No, you're not. You're not a physician in training. You're not in a training program. You are your first name, last name. You just have a few questions and you're going to go in and speak with your attending physician. Now, if you make this sound like, you know, I, you know, I took history, I examined, I diagnosed, I helped run the clinic. I saw a letter of recommendation from this physician that was so proud to leave their practice to this international medical graduate. And they felt so comfortable leaving him myself. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. And they wrote a letter of recommendation as a result of it. Now, imagine if you waive that right to see that letter. Let's say that you're a student and you didn't do as much as you should have. Um, uh, we had this discussion in our team uh, last night. And uh, the question was, do medical students do not for credit observerships? A lot of international medical students, they, you know, they, they, they secure clinical rotations at big name facilities, but it's really uh, a community service that they're doing, not as a clinical elective for international students, but a clinical observership. And they either do or don't disclose that to their medical school and the medical school gives them credit. And so I knew when I was in Atlanta at Morehouse, I, I knew that Emory would not offer medical student rotations to international. I just knew that because I tried to get it and I couldn't get it. And neither did Morehouse. And so when I would get applications from someone saying that I rotated at Grady or I was at Emory Healthcare, you know, I, you know, I know that they're name dropping and that just doesn't sit well. So students doing less than they should or, or, or overselling their, their experiences. What's the problem with that? Okay. The problem is this individual is going to be your co-resident is going to be your faculty. You need to be able to trust them at 2 AM, 2 30 in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, whatever they say is, is gold and, and you, you can't question it. But if, so, so if at this early on, if they're willing to do that, then then don't be surprised if, if a lot more issues come up. Yeah. So again, familiarity with U.S. healthcare system. We have a lot of different ways that we can tell. Now, letters of recommendation. Commitment to specialty is critical. You must get these letters from qualified writers. What makes a writer qualified is someone who's done 
what they're recommending you for in the setting that they're recommending you to. So if you have an MD who's not done residency, but is the primary investigator at Harvard, hey, pick any, you know, pick any institution, and they are recommending you for PGY1 residency because of the great work you did in research, that individual is not a qualified writer for PGY1. Although they have a great position, the name of the facility is great, if you're applying to research, maybe, yeah, but that's not a qualified writer. Let's say that it's a, uh, let's say it's a, uh, you know, physician that's done residency in China, but they've never done residency in the US and never even set foot in the United States, but they write really well. That's not a qualified writer, even though they're an internist in another country and they've done residency because our healthcare system is different. Think about holistic, look at that. Diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging, mission, goals, skills, experiences, attributes, and underrepresented healthcare workers. So that's what we're looking for in your experiences and that's what you're gonna be bringing to the table. And so if you can demonstrate that experience here in the United States, a sample of it and be able to describe that really well in your application and give us multiple examples of it, then you're on the right track. That's what we're looking for. Your letters of recommendation should do the same thing. Those are probably one of the most uh, controversial and important parts of your application. If the letter is outdated and, and an outdated letter is uh, one that you either keep changing the date on top or I've seen letters that they just remove the date and what a telltale sign, what a red flag um, when we see something like that. Or if it's not, uh, or if it's from research and you're using it for a rural program you're applying to, or, or it's not from specialty at all. Uh, let's say you have a letter of recommendation from PEDS, OB, surgery, and IM, and you use DORFS 4 to apply to family medicine, and you don't even give me a family medicine letter. What does that say? You know, you, 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 we know that you either have a, your, your family, you, we know you're applying to four different specialties. Sorry, we're, we're not the program for you. So those are some red flags. So how do you deal with it? Just avoid it. Know that, think of this as, you know, from a program's perspective, from an employer that doesn't like to lose its employees. So they want to pick them right. We don't want to lose them. And we don't want to go through the whole termination and dismissal. It's really bad for the whole morale of the program and probation. It's just really bad. Okay, so content of the letters, red flags in there. Most of the candidates are just so thrilled and excited when they get a letter that just says a bunch of nice things in it. And so to most candidates, it's indistinguishable whether this letter is, is effective or not, whether it's... Uh, you know, whether the content is personalized or not. And that's why we have a letter of recommendation analysis service in, in most of our memberships. And, uh, and, it's, and it's included in, in, and it's unlimited. You, if you can manage to get the letter not waived, which we recommend that you do not, I'm gonna repeat, I, I, I recommend that you do not waive your right to see your letter of recommendation. I think that it's really important that you see your letter. The only exception are US medical seniors, that's fine. Uh, but, but everybody else, you just don't have the relationship and you don't have enough knowledge of, of, the, of, of who the letter writer is. But the content, personalized versus generic, is very easily distinguishable by, by, by trained eye, by selection committees. And which is the reason why in 2021, the Coalition for Physician Accountability said, look, GME just has to do away completely with letters of recommendation. Just forget about it. And, and what we got to use now is structured evaluation letters. And um, which is what the emergency medicine has been doing for you know over 40 years with slows. Now there's four different types of slows that, that are acceptable. Internal medicine has just adopted structured evaluation letter SEL. And uh, so you know let these be you know a, a sign of the future in in kind of helping in what we got to do with our with our attending physicians to that we're getting really great experiences. Kind of prepare them. Uh, for ACG core competencies, to, to not copy and paste from previous letters. And it's challenging. I get it. Um, I, I'm 100% I sympathize with you. But don't make it worse by just, you know, putting blinders on and pretending like it's not happening. These letters are critical. They, they you know, you work 25, 30 years to get to this point, And it's not worth it, just the whole future being destroyed because of these red flags. So Take a look at it. Don't worry about the negative impact of not waiving your right. It's your right to see it. So it's part of FERPA, uh, Family Education Right and Privacy Act. You, it's your documents for your education and you have a right to it. The, the notion that if you waive your right, that means you trust the writer a lot more. When I go to program director symposiums and ACGME meetings, hardly any of the program directors are like that. That's like they're the epicenter of, of why they would select someone or not. Okay. Ah, being idle during the uh, pandemic. Look, when when U.S. medical schools told medical students to stay home. It shocked us. And a lot of them did. A lot of them were pretty upset that they wanted to get in there and they wanted to um, do their rotations. Regardless, 
if you were an international medical graduate or student and you had the opportunity to do something and you just absolutely the entire three and a half years you didn't do it it wasn't like you know just maybe the first year you didn't do anything like the entire three years you didn't do anything patient related or clinically related why you know at least it begs the question why and that is that's a bit of a red flag maybe you were a mom but maybe you were a dad you had other obligations i get it but i want to talk about it i want to know if that those obligations again is going to carry over and 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 i want to be the judge of uh, figuring out whether this is something that we've got to worry about or not so we gotta we gotta talk about it if you just study for the us MLEs, you know, I, I, I hold GME community and the program directors, a lot of them responsible for this. You know, those that just kept pushing, you know, score, score, scores, just because of, you know, the, their uh, unwillingness to, to train their staff and how to, how to review applications. And, you know, they just kept ignoring this and ignoring it and ignoring it. And now it's, it's being forced. And so I don't fully blame you if that's all you did, but if it was USMLE pass fail and you still spent another two years studying for step one, that's a red flag. If during this time, let's say that you had no clinical experience at all, we had we have candidates that would that would participate in uh, what was that called? Uh, COVID uh, tracing, I think that's yeah, COVID tracing, and they did COVID tracing. I mean, you know, and it was remote, and uh, there was tons of teams across the country, and uh, you know, and that's something good to talk about, even though it wasn't, you know, you you made a difference, so that would be good. And our question would be: Is does this individual have the resilience that's necessary for PGY one? You all remember when when pandemic started and we had uh, the, the first set that, that was 2020 2020 match you had individuals that started as pgy ones general surgery residents in new york i still speak with them they would have half of the residents team be just gone they're just not there because of COVID. and so you have 50 percent of the residents having to cover for not only the entire residency, but all the emergencies that came in and they have to not cross cover for emergency. If you haven't, if you don't have that type of personality or resilience, at least in your experiences, and if this happens again in another pandemic, how, how do I know you're, you're, you know, what kind of resident am I dealing with? So again, if you've had that experience, talk about it because it's a really, really good point in, in the holistic uh, application review. Uh, it tells a lot about the care, person's character and, and how they would uh, handle things if another pandemic came. Chat GPT. <laughs> AI generated documentation is now discussed by AAMC and it's a part of the agreements that you all sign that you cannot have any document that is generated by artificial intelligence. And it's just, I never thought that I would be saying this, but that's where we are. And, and I, you can kind of tell the, the, the documents are just too beautiful and it's just too well manicured. And maybe you can't tell that it's exactly created by, by, by um, a bot, but Regardless, if they can backtrack, I don't know how they would backtrack it, but uh, but you can't have any uh, AI generated documents. So if we feel, or if they feel that that's the issue, I'm, I'm not sure what they're gonna do. This is the first year that we see that. If there are red flags that are important to the program and, and common sense important, like attempts or, you know, three-year gap or, um, you know, switching of specialties is not discussed in a personal statement, those are red flags, so we'll talk about it. If your personal statement is too short or if it's too long, uh, be mindful of the, the 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 program's time with the holistic review is probably going to add you know a good percentage more time into how much it takes to 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 go through applications so you can help them by uh, by having a personal statement that's probably not more than like a thousand words uh, i think that that would be helpful so don't 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 look at this as a, as an opportunity to just and it's not don't no verbal diarrhea okay so just keep this succinct talk about, and, and I think the best way to put your personal statement together is to think about the 10 experiences you want to talk about in your ERS. And from these 10 experiences you want to talk about in your ERS, then kind of talk about some of those in your personal statement. And it's okay to not talk about everything, right? And that's, that's perfectly okay. We just want to see if you can help us with our holistic review. You have a lot of power when it comes to how these programs are going to look at your application and what direction they take it. So the, the, the experiences that you put down, the titles that you pick, the words that you choose, uh, how you put your personal statement together, the experiences that you've done and your commitment that you're showing, these all help us come to our conclusion really rapidly. And that's what we love. If, if the application helps facilitate this process and it just goes really smooth and fast, that you're, that's exactly what you want. It's a, it's a really nice natural progression of a strong applicant. If the experiences mentioned are completely irrelevant to postgraduate year one experiences that we're looking for, 
if they fail to show a program that they're truly an asset and if it's not your personal statement altogether. And what I mean by irrelevant to PGY1 is, uh, let's say that uh, you use a lot of generic or, or cliche or jargon in the personal statement and and it just, you know, it, it just doesn't do anything for us. We can't really tell what kind of person you are. And so that's a bit of a red flag because that tells us that you haven't really deductively you haven't gone through the reasoning of, of figuring out why you're here and what position you're applying to. You're, you're applying for a position of leadership and this leadership is going to start the moment you start. And it's one of the only jobs that is the immediate demand. And there are plenty of candidates that secure these positions with absolutely no leadership experience in their life. And so it just baffles me how this process actually works. So we're looking for those qualities to make sure that you make our July transition as smooth as possible communication and uh, professionalism if the individual is just desperate you know takes desperate steps oh boy uh corrects a resident in the middle of rounds and and they're not even a resident and they're just rotating if they go after a resident into electronic medical records and fix or update their orders if uh, this happens and and or or they they just walk into a hospital without being credentialed and and pretend like it's, it's uh, totally okay and they're supposed to be there or if they keep reusing an ID badge over and over again and it's already expired or, I mean, it's just the list goes on and on with regards to professionalism and, or or if they disrespect the, the coordinator on the phone, email, they keep demanding that they speak with a program director, they don't take a no for an answer. If the interview starts and you constantly have internet issues, uh, falsified data, tardiness, lying, showing up to the program unannounced, you know, I am here. I just uh, was in town and th th those things I, I, I used to do that myself, but that just doesn't fly anymore. Uh, you just, you can't do that. You know, uh, it's just times have changed. So, so don't do that. It's just it's scary when somebody does that. They're all just, uh, they're all on pins and needles. So they don't want to see anyone show up without an invitation just to say hi and then and, and get an interview. Okay. All right. So some of the questions that were asked, um, and, and by the way, if you if I haven't covered your your particular red flag or you want to talk about something, well, you don't you don't have to talk about your fly, red flag. But if there's a question you want to ask or if you want to speak with me directly, uh, go to raise your hand and, and you can unmute yourself and we'll, we'll talk. All right. So how best to address failed attempts? Uh, one of the depends on how many failed attempts you had. Number one, know what the problem is. The a problem of the program with failed attempts is you could potentially fail again. That's that's our problem. So if you pass step three if you have failed attempts you pass step three maybe that kind of calms us down a little bit but also i want to know how many times you failed if you failed step two ck five times why right and so it's just every every situation is different most people it's just one attempt sometimes it's you know yeah so so that's usually step one is very different a lot of people study the same way they did for step two the way they did step one and it doesn't work out that way so you know i would like to sit down and figure out what why is it that you feel like you failed and sometimes we just don't know you know it's just it's the toughest exam in the world as far as you ask me and so I, i'm not surprised that people fail i'm surprised that people pass this thing uh so how will program directors view if uh, it took you 1.5 more years to graduate because of covid repeat internal medicine step two after completing rotations you know what i would be looking for i would love it if someone in their application says that despite COVID, despite the rotations not being available, I still graduated on time. That's impressive rather than having a, you know, uh, so anyways, but I know that that's not the situation here. How will the program director view this? Stop using COVID as a crutch too much. And if it's COVID plus repeat internal medicine, plus repeat USMLE attempts, that's not a, a, a really a reassuring combination but but you could take it and say if you if there's truly a reason for why that internal medicine had to be let's say that that internal medicine had to be repeated not because you failed it but because the hospital shut down and so you had to repeat and so all the repeats are not always because of failures let's say that step two step two was shut down right i mean you couldn't uh you couldn't go to any prometrics for for months and and COVID is obviously with COVID is real but uh, if we can avoid using that more than once or twice, then then I'll be happy. 1.5 years, I would then want to look at your MSPE and and see what the what the dean says. And I hope the dean isn't trying to sell the idea that it's okay for 1.5 years 
uh, delay. And and I hope that they're they're pretty candid about it and and they see they they show how they monitored you during this time. So at some point you can't explain you know all of the red flags. You just have to show that there were enough people aware and informed. We all knew what was going on and we got through it, or I got through it. Uh, not that I'm proud of it, but I got through it and. Um, I didn't let it crush me. I didn't let me let it. I didn't let it change my direction of my uh, wanting to be a physician. And and I'm, you know, I'm I'm hoping that uh, that the clinical experiences that I've done and the letters of recommendation they attest to my commitment to family medicine. So let's see if that works. Where other than personal statements to address failed USMLE attempts? I don't think anywhere else. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that we anywhere else. And it'll be very light touch at, at that, uh, but it's got to be mentioned. Well, I guess, I guess, technically speaking, if you don't release your USMLE transcripts, you're you're withholding that information. So I guess the other place that you're discussing your USMLE attempts is is by releasing your your transcript. How do I explain low step one or CK score? You don't, you don't. If you pass it on the first attempt, great for you. You know, stop beating yourself over the head because you didn't score a specific three digit. Thankfully. We're at the start of those days being gone and you see up all the objective evidence to see it. So it's the way you handle the situation and, and, and what you create, this is not a red flag anymore. I don't want you to make it a red flag. And for those program directors that make this a red flag, you know, shame on you, you know, please stop that because it, it's, it's not the norm anymore. Let's focus on them being able to overcome this incredible exam rather than reaching an arbitrary three-digit score. USMLE score or USMLE altogether was never ever meant to be a, you know, a tool for residency selection ever. It's a medical license examination. That's it, it's for medical license, not for residency entry. So you don't worry about it. You don't make it a, a big deal in, in your ERS application, in your interview. Don't introduce yourself, like, you know, the first sentence where you introduce, hi, my name is, you know, I don't know, Padram Mizani. And, you know, I'm an international medical graduate. My USMLE step one was a, you know, a 197. It's not that good. My step two CK, my score wasn't that good either. I'm not proud of my score. That's not who you are, right? So let's focus on holistic review and, and what could you bring to the program? Uh, so thankfully, thankfully, those 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 days are hopefully behind us. Why have you not taken step three? Uh, because it's not required uh, and and it's unnecessary. There are program directors that want that. There are residency programs that want that. And if you're intent on going to those programs and, and, and if you if you're scoring well on your step three practice exams and you have plenty of sub internship type of experience and and OK, then fine, uh, take it, I guess, if that's where you want to end up. But step three, even including internal medicine, less than uh, I think it's 14 percent of the program directors in internal medicine look for step three. And the importance of that was less than your performance in basic sciences. And this is in the 2021 program director survey. So these, you know, loud mentors who, or, you know, physicians that keep telling you take step three without any justifiable reason. If you had multiple attempts on steps, then okay, I see that, but not just because to get an interview, you know what, if that's the case and you don't want to go into those programs, then apply to 30 more programs and, and you, you, more than enough uh, make up for this. Uh, just know that there's 14% of the programs out there that look for step three and the importance is, is somewhere a little bit above your performance in basic sciences. But there are programs that are diehard step three fans and that's the way they differentiate the high volume of medical graduates that apply to them and, and uh, that's, that's what works for them. Again, if you wanna go there and that's how you wanna prepare your application, fine. But uh, there are you know, thousands of residency programs across the country. Uh, if you fail step three, that's almost irreversible. Uh, why are you now applying uh, for the match after so many years? Let's figure out why. And and everybody's story is a little bit different. Why did you do all telerotations? We we covered this. How should I have written my letter of interest? Look, there's no such a thing as a letter of interest. You want to make yourself believe that there is such a thing? Then fine. That's a mistake. You, you, your, your letter of interest was your ERAS application that you applied to the programs with. If you want to go ahead and follow that up with another dissertation, uh, another autobiography about yourself, another version of your personal statement. And if you think programs appreciate that, be my guest. They don't. They don't like that. Now, if you're going to follow up with the programs with a really good reason, then that's good. You don't need a letter of interest. Your ERAS application, if it's put together well, it should do the job. Why no U.S. clinical experience? Yeah. Why, why no U.S. clinical experience? That's a great question. 
fix it. I, I don't know how to fix this for you, uh, other than telling you to get U.S. clinical experience. It's the it's the cornerstone, if not the entire foundation of your residency application. The more of it that you have, the more residency relevant that it is, the better off you are. Next one, how much personal health issues uh, should I disclose? None, none. You don't disclose your own personal health issues. You don't disclose your family's personal health issues. You don't talk about your mom and dad having cancer. You don't talk about your brother having uh, developmental delays. You don't do any of that. You don't do that. It's, it's HIPAA violation. Uh, and it's your own private health information that you're voluntarily putting out there. And they're gonna use that against you. Uh, they will at some point, somebody is. I, I got a, it was a residency reentry, a program director letter who said, I recommend this person to your program. And in there said, we believe that the reason why she didn't do well is because she had major depressive disorder. What? Are you kidding me? You literally, you, you're telling me this resident had major MDD. And so I got on the phone with the PD and I said, um, uh, why did you do this? And and she, I finally got her to change that. And, and, and I don't know why I didn't even click. But so don't disclose these personal health information. Not everybody is uh, is knows what to do with it uh, or, or is going to be professional about it. Is a two-year gap okay if we do something during that period? Gap is not okay, but depends on what you're doing. I think you know the answer to this question uh, at this point. How do I explain why I'm applying to pathology? <laughs> um, this happened um, last week at a, at a networking uh, event that I went to, and I was speaking with uh, with this doctor uh, from, from um, abroad, and and I said, he's, this is what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm applying to residency. And I said, what specialty? He said, pathology. But, you know, so I'm going to go and do research. And, and, um, and uh, you know, so I hope to be applying next year. I don't have time to apply this year. And I said, why pathology? And I found out because his friend that was right there next to him uh, got into a pathology program after seven years of, you know, jumping around these academic institutions. And, and I asked him, why, you, why pathology? And he said, well, because uh, I just like the specialty. And I said, have you ever done pathology? And he said, no. I said, do you even know what pathology entails? Well, yeah, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, cross sections and a lot of, you know, speaking with other physicians that didn't have any idea, no experience at all. And so I was able to tell him to do internal medicine. And that story was a lot better. How do I explain why I'm applying to pathology? Ask yourself, why am I applying to pathology? If you have six, seven years of experience in it, that makes sense pathology assistant, lab work, research, maybe you were a pathologist abroad. Being a pathologist abroad is actually sometimes it's an advantage sometimes to pathology programs, but just uh, that was a, that was an interesting question that had come up. Okay. Well, does anybody have any questions that, that uh, would like to uh, have asked? Okay. Got it. Let's go over here. All right. So, um, all right. So uh, I'm assuming Dr. MBT, welcome. Hi. Um, so I have a few questions. Yes, please. Yes, please. Oh. All right. So um, I did have a question in regards to waiving um, rights in, uh, for the LORs. Are we able to waive rights for some, but not for others? Or does it, we can do that? Is there any um, benefit to doing that? So some attending physicians will just not want you to waive your right and um, or they want you to waive your right and, and they'll They'll tell you that this is your best option and there's no other options. You shouldn't do anything else. You're going to hurt yourself, et cetera. And you can't change their mind. So, so, so be it. I hope that you have some conversations with them and, and have an idea of what, what this letter is going to be. And at least I hope you have some, they have some insight with regards to ACGME core competencies and they can talk about it. Uh, but yes, you could have some that are waived and some that are not waived. Yes, you could certainly do that. All right, great. Um, the other question that I have is how do I properly, because I do have gaps but it wasn't because I failed any exams. It was because the school had required, um, they placed additional requirements in regards to exit exams. Um, there was a lot of delays with um, mandatory prep programs where it didn't matter what my, um, what I wanted to do or not wanted to do. It was mandatory. If we had any issues, we would be completely, we'd be gone. So is there a way, there's uh, there's a lot of significant gaps due to that and due to some of the school's, uh, um, I guess, choices as to what they wanted the students to do. Is there a good and political and diplomatic way to address this without, because obviously I don't want to speak negatively, uh, realistically speaking, I don't want to 
throw any shade in regard to any academic establishment. I feel it's in bad taste, but at the same time, how do I take responsibility for it without making myself look like a weak candidate? How much time are we talking about? I started um, in fall of 2018. I'm applying to match 2024 right now. And, uh, and uh, how long does it take to graduate from graduate the program from normally? Um, it's technically uh, marketed as a um, three and a half to four year program. So two or three years. Yeah, I feel that's a very significant. What country what is country this? Is this? Um, I'm a US IMG. No, no, but what's what, 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 um, the school is located um, on a Caribbean island. Okay. okay. So, yes, you're right. You've got to be very careful about um, uh, how you make your medical education. Sound. I would want to see how first they would describe these two years um, in, in MSP. I would have a sit down with the with the dean or whoever is drafting this MSP and, and just focus on that and, and ask them, what do you plan to say? and 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 start with that and you know maybe they'll start talking maybe they'll talk about things that are um not really the issue i think the one thing you have going for you is the pandemic <laughs> and they'll probably use that in the msb as the reason why there was a delay and if that's the case then then that's where you stop okay thank you um and then one last question super brief i know that you said don't break hipaa don't talk about anybody's health I have written my personal statement and I included, and I want to know if this is a bad idea. I included my, I included a surgical experience that I had as a patient without disclosing what kind of surgery or what it was in order to illustrate my level of maturity and my, uh, my level of, I would say, I guess, change in um, thought process and in respect to patients that are going through a similar experience it gave me an additional level of respect and maturity to the whole process and it just making sure that that is still appropriate where i'm not actually disclosing what surgery or any actual details it sounds like you have a really good obviously you have a great great uh, command of the english language you can communicate very clearly and and, and effectively and i so i think that i i think that's exactly what it sounds like in your personal statement as well. Are you applying to surgery? Yes, sir. General surgery. If it's if it's just you being in a patient's shoes and um, and you know be a, a significant life event, uh, I think that it could uh, if it's done right, it could be a, a very powerful personal statement. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Great questions. Thanks for uh, raising your hand. Um, all right, great. Uh, let me just see. Uh, how long is considered a good amount of time uh, to dedicate yourself to prepare for each USMLE steps and not fall into the red flag category? Honestly, it's, uh, well, if you ask test preparation companies, they'll tell you six months. If you ask residency programs, it's, you know, probably between two to four months. And so that's what the number is. But because it's kind of interspersed throughout so many other experiences, a lot of times it's you that kind of says, why well, starting for studying for USMLE that this year and I didn't take it until this year. So a lot of times it's us that create that red flag i think if uh if the idea if the if it's presented as look i i decided to take it i you know studied for you know a handful of months and and i sat for it rather than talking about how you know five years ago you you attempted to study for it and you didn't show up to the the exam uh, you know that's too much information so just really think about how you're you're presenting your, your the time that you're dedicating to your assembly preparation so i would say two to four months uh, and um, don't dive too much into it. All right. Well, okay, everyone. Well, uh, thank you so much for everybody being here. I don't think there's any other raised hands. Appreciate y'all everybody's time and see you in the next webinar. Bye-bye.